Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of AFL Fantasy Head to Head brought to you by AFL Fantasy Fanatics. Thanks Tim for um, remembering that me to mention that but I'm Bales, your host as always and joining me is another special guest. You know him from the traders and the website DT Talk. It is the pod photo as they call him, Warney. Warney, how you going? Good Bales, great to be here mate. Hope you're having a good one. You're enjoying your pre-season? Yes, it's been a very busy one actually compared to last season. With as I mentioned, the AFL Fantasy Fanatics podcast and Twitter Spaces, it's busy times, and yeah, it's pre-season as you as you full well know. You and the boys obviously really busy with all your content and stuff. So it's it's pre-season is definitely in full swing, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Well, we're down to under five weeks to go now, so it's all very exciting. And um, yeah, it is in full swing, and we get to see some games soon, which will probably change our mind on a few things again coming up. Yeah, no, I can't wait for those pre-season games to start. But today is AFL Fantasy at Ted, so we will be talking about two players where we just uh, put two players head-to-head that are either similar positions, similar price, or all of the above, and and we pick who we'd pick out of the two. So today we've got two premium midfielders, two of the best in the competition, especially last year, and um, for one of them it's been quite a number of years. But we're talking about Fremantle Dockers midfielder Andrew Brayshaw and Melbourne Demons midfielder Clayton Oliver. So both those going head to head. I'll be taking Andrew Brayshaw today and Warney will be taking Clayton Oliver today. So Warney, how about you just kick us off with Clayton Oliver? Why should people be picking Clayton Oliver in their sides for 2023? Guess he's just one of the best, and that's the thing that we do love about him. He's um he's been amazing, really. And if you haven't really looked into his history, it's it's worth a look just to understand how good he has been. So he debuted with 13 games and averaged 69, a very nice 69, but then jumped up to 101.5 in his second year, played every single game. Now he's played every single game since that debut season, uh, except for one last year where he missed it with that broken hand. So um he's been incredible. So yeah, basically 2017 yep. until now. He's played every game except for one. Um, and all of those averages have been over 100, with the lowest being basically a 106. Um, yes, the Corona Ball one says a 91.7, but if you put that out, it's actually his career best as a 115. So he's just an absolute machine with his scoring. And I think we've all known that and seen that. Um, and I guess the positives about it is that that's what you're going to get from him. You're going to get a guy that is the CBA man. So he was uh, always in um, Melbourne's centre bounces, so had averaged the most for them last year. Um, that's even, you know, more than any Ruckman or whatever, but obviously gone with sharing a bit there with Jackson. But um, Oliver... 87% of the CBA. So that is his job and that's about all it's going to be. So um, you have him in there with all his mates there in Viney, Petrarca. They were about 75% each. And and then we'll see how that sort of plays out in the wash. But he's the, the first one picked in the guts. That's his role to play. And he sort of, he does well like hitting all the different stat lines too, I think. That's um when you sort of break down his scoring. Um, kicks make up 41% of his score, handballs make up 33%. So a lot of people think that he's a bit handball happy, which I guess he is if he is handballing um, 33% of his score time, um, if you want to put it into those words. It's a, um, that might be a bit of a concern, but the thing is he gets it back as well. That's the important part about Clary Oliver is that inside that does play all right on the outside, although his marks might be something that some other players you might be able to get better value from. But he does tackle as well, so all of that stuff does add up quite nicely with his scores. So um, has a bit of a ceiling. So he showed last year he had a couple of those bigger scores there, a few over 130, um, had a had a 150 slotted in there as well. So it's nice to be able to get those types of scores, but his floor is super high. So that's a nice thing about Clayton Oliver. It's just really a pick where, and I will talk about whether we pick him or not in our sides a little bit later, but he's someone that you could start with just because you know what you're going to get. He's that set and forget premium with possibly some upside. Like, and this is where it goes a little bit against what I'm all about with my initial sides because I would like more upside than what there could be there. But the thing is, he the upside that he is, he could be that top scoring player in the competition. If not, he's at least in that top four or five um, at worst, I think, if he just keeps going about his business in the same way. And so draft is certainly a place where he is very high on the radar and you're picking him ahead of other guys that you might even 
semi consider that they're going to be better just because of that durability that we talked about before playing all of those games straight. So Clary Oliver, he is a great selection if you're willing to start with him. Um, just he averages over 100 for his career and he's won 47 games. So um, I just love him and everyone loves a blood nut. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's incredible plays. Just the as you said, the durability and consistency as well. Is just it's incredible. Like him and probably Rory Laird are probably the two standouts for consistency. So, but big change with the Melbourne midfield though. That I was just going to get your take on. Um, Brody Grundy is now there, so they've now got two of the premier ruckmen in the competition now. Really hitting it down Clayton Oliver's throat. So could, that surely is only going to be a good thing, isn't it? Well, I see that as a positive, and that could be where some of that upside does come from because he is someone that gets his first hands on it out of that midfield group as well. So it's not only just the opportunity to be in the centre bounces. He is someone that would be getting it. And now that he's pretty much not going to be left hanging at all when you've got, whether it's Gone or Grundy and little birdie Toby today, it'll be uh, Max Gone taking the first bounces by the sounds of it. So um, I... I thought it might have been a bit of Grundy action and the way that they'll play that um, floating back. So that's, a, I guess, a story for another day with how that all works. But I think by having those two, especially when Jackson was a developing Ruckman, um, that's the thing where it's going to probably help Oliver and his teammates as well in the midfield. Yeah. Um, and do you see the tag being an issue for Oliver? We know that he can get past them, but we do see every now and again, maybe a game or two out of the blue, he might give you just like a 70 or whatever. Do you see him that being an issue or do you see maybe Petrarch getting more of the attention or, or how do you see that playing out? Yeah, and that's probably the issue because I do see Petrarca as someone, if he is copying the tag, he does move forward, whereas for Clary, that doesn't really happen for him. But in saying that, sort of that ceiling, we only saw one score. I'm just trying to exactly find the number. One score under 87 last year from his 21 games, that and that was Adler. one where he... Yeah, and so that was that game. He, um, Yeah, he had 19 touches in that, so definitely well below. Um, but it was pretty much a, a, he just quietened down after half time with how that was working. Um, I think the the other one too, uh, his next loss, which was that 87, he was tagged there by Aish against Fremantle. So yeah. um, that, was, um, that was his only, well, that was his other score or his second lowest score and if 87 is your second lowest it's pretty bad but uh, it's pretty good sorry um but if you are looking at um if you are looking at a guy that is that price to that 112 that he is that well you don't want those sorts of scores popping up at all because if you do cop one of those early on then it doesn't make it a great starting selection yeah no definitely agree um Clayton Oliver definitely uh, one are going to be one of the premier midfielders competition but so is this other guy so Andrew Brayshaw from uh Fremantle so he had a massive jump from 2021 so I'm just getting up his exact numbers but he averaged 112.4 last season in AFL fantasy so that was up from I'm just getting 2021 up right here as my internet uh takes forever to load but it was a fairly substantial jump so yeah one from of the best com- yeah up from 104. Okay, thank you, my bloody internet. Um, but yeah, so big jump from him, really pushing himself up into those top couple of midfielders with some massive scores as well. So he had that 181 against St Kilda in round two, which is when a lot of people would have jumped on him the week after. So he's just consistent. So I guess people's probably worry with Andrew Brayshaw's the tag, but we did see a couple of times last season where he was able to brush the tag off. There were a couple of games where he's had a bit more in check, like the game against Richmond where he got a 79 and Geelong where he got a 77. But a lot of people know he got tagged against West Coast in round three for 96. He was only on about 30 or something or below that at half time, end up on 96. So he does show that he can bounce back from a tag with a good second half. Same with Gold Coast. and caught a bit of attention there as well, but he was able to get his way to a 94. But yeah, definitely one of the best movements in the competition. And as we said with Clayton Oliver, does like to fill the stat lines up. So he gets his marks, gets his tackles, and can, as we saw the 180, 181, can really put a ceiling up there. Oh, hang on. That's my water bottle going there. Um, but yeah, so he's absolutely fantastic. Um, Warney, what do you see with Andrew Brayshaw in terms of his positives heading into this season? Because we did mention with Oliver that could potentially be a bit handball happy as well, but we do know that Andrew Brayshaw does prefer to kick the ball a bit more um, with most games having more kicks and handballs. So what are your thoughts on Brayshaw? Yeah, I like him a lot. He's a machine. I was a proud owner of him last year, and it was nice to see those ceiling scores. I think that's what's nice about him, but um, to pretty much 
almost averaged the same um, points there as Clary. Clary had that consistency, uh, and I think Brayshaw, you had the the ups and downs along the way, and the downs weren't too bad, um, to be honest, but I think Clary obviously had more of those 100-plus scores, whereas we did see a few of those low ones. It was those couple of tags there, but as you said, he does rescue them, which is, um, which is a nice thing for your players to be able to do along the way because you can get very frustrated with where they're at at times and then what they can end up doing. So I think the, the key about Brayshaw is the ceiling and that Clary does have those couple of years extra on him um, that, you know, the, the sky is a bit of the limit for Brayshaw. Could we see a a 120 plus year coming from him at some point and could it be this early so probably my where i'm not as hot on brayshaw is doing my draft rankings and just going could he cop that little bit more attention could that sort of stuff affect him and they've got a bit of a change in their midfield too obviously monday retired so he's out but also bringing in jager o'meara and i think that they'll be wanting to get some more mid clock into some of the kids so like your erasmus and um, he's probably one there. And as as fantasy classic coaches would love to see Matthew Johnson get a game on the way through. But but yeah, they've got the Jager bomb coming in. They've got um, Erasmus, even just Caleb Sarong, who has been thwarted a bit by his time on ground across the time. So um, I can only assume that that increases as it did during the season anyway. But that's something there. In saying that though, I honestly think that Brayshaw is not going to change anything about what he does in the guts with his center bounces. So when you're looking at that um, across their side, he was um, their number one guy with 76% of the center bounces. You have Will Brody there and Caleb Sarong in the mid sixties. Um, and then we'll see what that means for O'Meara coming in as well. And the other, the young kids, as I mentioned before too, and even like we were hearing about Nat Fife, um, playing all forward, but he certainly will chop out in the guts at times too, like if that's a little bit of a, a end of quarter type thing that he might roll in. So that's probably the only thing that is a concern, the tag, because he'll still be that number one tag target for um, Frio, and that's where Clary might just have him over that. But um, the other side of it is just, just a, a little bit more change for him, whereas we talked about Clary's change is um, just basically bringing in um, – the other best ruckman in the competition, um, whereas for Brayshaw, it's a little bit of a a few extra um, a few extra interesting parts of how his season may play out. Yeah, no, definitely agree. And as I, as we said with the Grundy thing, I can only see as a positive for Oliver. But in terms of what you said, in terms of the uh, hundred plus scores, so Clayton Oliver only went under a hundred on four occasions last year with uh, with two of those with a ninety uh, and an eighty seven, then the sixty eight. Whereas Brayshaw was nine games under a hundred. But to be fair, there was one, two, three, four of those were uh, not above ninety. So. Very, very close, but as you said, you can see that Oliver's floor is a bit higher, whereas Brayshaw can tend to maybe drift maybe that 90 a little bit lower, whereas Oliver doesn't really have many of those games at all. So, yeah, uh, the only other thing, I, the only slight flag I don't like with Brayshaw is his starting couple of fixtures next year. The little tiny flag concern. So this would be good for Kaskala Hardness, this one right here, but St Kilda opening round. Ross, the boss is there. He has used a tag in the past. I wouldn't be surprised if they did put a tag into him in round one. And then North Melbourne as well. We, you never know, Clarko there. Do they put a tagger in there against Fremantle? We just don't know. So that's just a little flag there. And then he's got West Coast, funny enough, who do actually have put attention to him in the past. So those just those opening three could be a bit tricky. But I expect Brayshaw to still put up numbers. But if we're looking for little sort of slight flags, these, as you know, these premiums are always like high-scoring players. Just these little... Little things can be the difference between you selecting them and them getting off to a 120 average over the first month and then them averaging like a 95 over the first month. So, and he could drop a lot of money because they are both very expensive. So, there we go. So, that's the two players discussed. So, now it's time for us to pick out of the two who we would pick. So, one, I'm going to get you start off. So, who would you be picking out of Andrew Brasher and Clayton Oliver? It is a very tough question. I'm a fan of both. Um, and both, actually, I wouldn't pick either of them because it goes against my fantasy philosophy for that starting pick. And like, as you said there with Brayshaw, at 112, he could go down in price and he probably will go down in price. Only has to take one of those games and that could be that round one tag that does that. Um, that's, that's the concern there. So on the flip side of that, though, he's the one that could actually go higher and score better than Clary Oliver. So it's that little bit of consistency for our Clary. 
but then there is that ceiling that we're seeing for a brace or that which could really get you off to a flyer if that could work. So I'm going to say if you've got agates, you are going to go with Brayshaw because of what you could do. However, I'm probably one of the softest and safest fantasy players going around. Vanilla is a nice flavour. And if I was picking one of those to start, it would be Clary Oliver because I a, know what I'm getting. He's going to be a top four midfielder. I'll claim that one. I think I've actually got him number two in my draft rankings at the moment. So um, just because, and that's the draft sort of side of it going, the um, consistency is one thing, but also just that durability. That's why I've got him so high. And um, yeah. And then the other, other little part while talking about draft is which one do you pick first in a keeper league? I think it's Brayshaw because of those couple of extra years that he's got in the system on top of him. But they are both super picks, and I think that they will probably be people that we could go about over these next few years of talking a head-to-head because they'll be very close to each other, I think, all the way through over the next half a dozen years or so. But all right, I'm going to put it out there, and I'm going to go have a crack and go with Brayshaw, although the Warn Dogs would actually go with Oliver because I'm soft. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I like that. Um, yeah, uh, out of the two, there's as you said, there's not much difference. Like even the price, nine ninety five for Brayshaw, nine ninety four for Oliver. So you can't say oh, <laughs> um, the price. So they're exactly the same. But I think I just lean Oliver, and that's only because, as I mentioned, just those first couple of games. I just plus I, I like both players anyway, so I can't really use favoritism here. But I, I, I like watching Oliver play as well, and he's just his floor is a lot. A lot higher so i don't see him drastically dropping in price a lot and as you mentioned if he got a tag against st kilda in round one and he got like a let's say 70 or whatever that's going to be uh, based into his average his price will plummet and then you'll be able to get him for maybe 100 or so kg whereas oliver mm. i don't see him going much really under 950 all year like he'll average he'll probably be above 900k all year um so yeah i'd be going clayton oliver there um but he's very close as you mentioned but uh warning have you got either or both in your side or have you got none at the moment so none of them at the moment i think um and it's probably been a philosophy for the last decade or so for me is not to really start the top price players um especially in the midfield i think we can find some there but i think this year is quite challenging in the sense of there are a lot of options and picking the right ones it's more about picking those guys at about that hundred or so and if there was someone about that 112 ish I'm going a little bit lower in the sense that I've got Jack still there in my side at the moment. So I'm I'm happy to be taking him, mainly because he went that 120 the year before. So that's where I'm feeling a bit more comfortable there. And it's a little bit like that argument of the the brasher of saying that he's got that ceiling. I think the the full season long average ceiling could be where I like a Jack Steel a little bit better. Yeah, and Jack Steele's probably another one we could have thrown in that discussion with Laird and Oliver in terms of just that pure consistency. So, uh, yeah, he's definitely a fantastic pick, and he's in the mix for me. But I don't have either either. Uh, so that's four episodes done uh, in this series, <laughs> and I haven't had one of the players yet. But he's in the mix. Oliver's in the mix, I guess, as the R, uh, not R1, M1. I've got Laird there at the moment. I'm, I've been a fan, obviously. Everyone knows I love Laird. So he's he's my number one midfield at the moment, and I don't know if I'm going to move him out unless uh, I need that cash, which – 1.07 million is a lot of dollars. So save me a couple of hundred K to go down to a Kelly or, or Bont who we had in the first episode in this series. Uh could be a could be a play as well. But yeah, currently don't have both, but both very good selections to start off the season. So that's another episode done of the AFL Fantasy Head Ten the book. So let us know your thoughts in the comments section below um, of the video. If you'd pick uh, either one, if you wouldn't pick any, any other questions you guys have, leave them in the comment section below uh, or send the questions to AFL Fantasy um, fans um, so me and Tim can answer those for you. And don't forget to tune into the Twitter spaces Sundays at 4.30 p.m. Um, in Perth and then 7.30 p.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time for um, all the Eastern States for the live Twitter space. And then available as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, and that shortly after wherever you get your podcasts. So thanks, Warnie, for jumping on, mate. Um, what can the, the listeners and everyone be expecting from the traders and stuff throughout the preseason and into the season proper? 
Oh, heaps to come still. It's uh, down to the last few weeks to go. Um, we'll have heaps of content on afl.com.au, also on DT Talk. So make sure you're clicking back there. The deck of DT has been flying this year. It's been lots of fun um, reading everyone's different views. And I think the beauty of that is that we get a lot of different voices in the community. And it's a really fun thing. And I think that's what's great about fantasy footy these days, that there's lots of different podcasts out there, lots of different content providers. So um, we love that everyone gets the opportunity through the deck of DT to, to have their say, which is a nice thing. And then obviously, through social as well but nothing bales we'll be catching up with you in a couple of weeks time in adelaide we're heading over to adelaide for our uh bit of a show we're catching up with our mates from the keeper league there and um thanks to game day squad they're getting us over there to do it so it's going to be a lot of fun to uh have an afternoon talking some fantasy food on the beers only a couple of weeks out from the season starting. So it's sort of a good crunch time to be getting together with some um, mates. And so if you've got your mates in a league that you want to get down and have some pre-season beers and, and fantasy banter, it'll be a perfect place to get along to. Hopefully we'll see you there, Bales. I'll definitely be there. I was going to mention that. I'm looking forward to the Adelaide show in a couple of weeks. So if anyone's in Adelaide or if you're in another state, fly over. Fly over for a, for a good hour <laughs> of fun. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of starting teams, people with the with the phones out on the apps, because the app's now out as well, which is fantastic. So is. Uh, people will be Finally. checking all that. <laughs> people will be checking all their teams and, and making changes. So now it'll be good fun uh, in Adelaide at the Highway Hotel. So um, make sure you follow Warning and Trays as well if you don't already. I'm sure most of you do. But if you don't, make sure you go and follow them uh, on the AFL app, on DT Tour, podcast, wherever all their content is. Make sure you go and follow them. And follow um, Warning. Where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, at Warning DT. So, yeah, jump on there. And, um, yeah, and especially the AFL fantasy stuff, which is good. We're trying to build up those platforms, especially we've now got an Instagram page on uh, at AFL fans. We've got that hooked up this year. We've got some pretty cool stuff going on there. I'm learning a little bit more about making cooler, sweeter graphics and they're coming through all right and get to use a bit of match vision and stuff for stuff now too, which is pretty fun to have a bit of a play with. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely go and follow uh, the Instagram account there as well. So, Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it as well. And also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already as we continue our goal of reaching 1,000 subscribers. Your support is always very much appreciated. So we will catch you guys in the next episode with another special guest. We're out. See you then. Thanks, Bales.